welcome to Unity Presbyterian Church Online. This Sunday is Palm Sunday, so Pastor David leads us through the shouts of Hosanna and blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's listen. Well, as some of you might know, throughout high school, I worked at an amusement park. And part of that job was you'd show up and they'd tell you this is where you're going to work that day. And the one job that nobody wanted was paddle boat rentals. And the reason for that was because in a park full of roller coasters and water slides, who really wanted to do paddle boats, particularly when it costs extra? You know, it costs more than admission itself. Uh, in fact, we've got a picture of um, an aerial view, and what I want you to notice is you've got all of these water slides and roller coasters, and then way off in the corner is the paddle boat rentals where nobody goes and nobody cares. <laughs> so when I, you know, when I would be assigned there, hours would go by without me interacting with anybody. And I would just be bored to tears sitting there going, please, someone, someone come. Let me rent you a paddle boat. This is excruciating. And if the hours got too long, and if the boredom became too excruciating, I found, found myself kind of walking down to the paddle boat dock and then slyly just untying one of the boats and then kind of walking back to my post. And without fail, within 10 minutes, that boat would end up floating away just right in the middle of the lake. And so I would go, oh, all right, I need to go get that boat. Look at it. It's floating away. So I would jump on a paddle boat, and I would paddle to the middle of the lake and grab the boat, and then realize how hard it is to paddle two boats back to the dock. But eventually, I'd be huffing and puffing and would make it back and would have to kind of let the second one go and just glide back as I jumped off mine and tied it up really quick and then ran and grabbed that one before it floated away again and tied that one up really quick. And, and it was a huge hassle. So you might be wondering, well, then why would you do that? I mean, you put yourself in the middle of that hassle. And I would say, yeah, but I wasn't bored. And that's what really mattered. Because I just needed at least 10 minutes of, well, let's activate that mind a little bit and not become bored anymore. I wonder if you can relate to those feelings of just excruciating boredom. Where you're really wondering, okay, what can I do? to make life a little bit more interesting. And if we're being honest, I mean, sometimes probably in, your, probably in your history, church has felt like that, huh? I mean, probably not here, not here, but maybe sometime in your history, church has felt like that. But what I want you to hear today is that Palm Sunday should not be one of those Sundays. No, Palm Sunday is a day of celebration, enthusiastic celebration, Palm Sunday is the day where no boredom is allowed. And so I hope you feel that today. Even from home, I hope you feel that energy that comes with such a wonderful day of celebration. Now, normally on this Sunday, we study the, the familiar story of Jesus riding on a donkey, coming into Jerusalem, and we call that his triumphant entry. Today, we're not going to study that story, at least not directly, and there's a reason why. It's because as Jesus rode on that donkey and went into Jerusalem, and as those crowds gathered and laid down their cloaks and cut palm branches and, and waved them and laid those down as well, as they did that, the whole crowd collectively were reciting one phrase over and over again. Do you remember what that phrase is? Let's, let's go back and read. This is the account from Matthew 21. We're told most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. That's the phrase. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
That is a specific saying that was said by that whole crowd for a specific reason. What's that reason? Why were they all reciting that together? Well, they were quoting. Quoting from Psalm 118. That's what I want to study today. I want to study Psalm 118 to figure out why. Why was this whole crowd seeing Jesus come into Jerusalem? Why did they think to say that phrase, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord? What is the significance of them reciting that together? That's what I'd like to explore to give us almost the foundation of Palm Sunday. Okay, there's a couple things you need to know about Psalm 118 as we begin this study together. The first is that Psalm 118 is categorized as a hallelujah psalm. Yes, there are seven psalms out of the 150 psalms in the Psalter that are categorized as hallelujah psalms. It's from Psalm 111 through 118. Those are the hallelujah psalms. And they're called that because these particular psalms were used in corporate worship. Uh, much like what we're doing today. They were used to point a, a group of people, a congregation, towards celebration, towards hallelujah, exactly what we're doing today. What makes you want to say hallelujah? What sort of feelings or emotions make you want to say hallelujah? Well, I mean, first off, We don't say hallelujah, do we? We shout hallelujah. We go hallelujah. There's some enthusiasm, some excitement that comes from that word hallelujah. You say it when you're excited about something. You say it when you've received some really good news and you go, oh, hallelujah. Yes, you say it because there's something in your life that makes you want to shout hallelujah. There's an excitement that comes with that word and with those seven psalms. So we then, as we read Psalm 118, we are meant to read this psalm with the same sense of excitement. Okay, that's the first thing I want you to know about this psalm. The second thing I want you to know is that Psalm 118 is an entrance liturgy. An entrance liturgy. What that means is that this congregation, as they were reciting together this hallelujah psalm, they would actually start outside the walls of Jerusalem, and then they would together walk towards Jerusalem, reciting, singing, shouting this psalm. They would enter through the gates of Jerusalem, and then right towards the temple itself, their place of worship, before concluding the psalm and starting their uh, time of worship in the temple itself. So this has historically been called an entrance liturgy because this psalm was recited as they were entering Jerusalem and entering the temple. So I want you to now imagine that setting. Imagine that you are a part of that crowd and that all the people together are walking towards Jerusalem. You can see it off in the distance, and together here is what you are shouting. You're saying, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, His love endures forever. Can you feel the excitement? Those four verses provide of Psalm 118 as the crowd walked towards Jerusalem and they were affirming the eternally enduring love of God. Kind of makes you want to shout hallelujah, doesn't it? Now, you can see that there's three groups that are addressed in this psalm. There is Israel, the house of Aaron, and then all those who fear the Lord. Those three groups pretty much encompassed everybody. That was kind of like saying, hey, we're all affirming God's enduring love together. Now, this was a call and response. And so the leader would say something like, hey, let Israel say. And the response from the crowd would be, 
His love endures forever. Now, we're good Presbyterians, and we could study this together, but today I'd like us to participate in it. I really want us to get a sense of what that would feel like if we were in that crowd reciting Psalm 118 together. So here's how we are going to do it. This section over here, you guys are section one. And so when I say in the call and response, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, all you're going to say is his love endures forever. But you got to say it like you mean it, okay? All right, so you're section one. You guys right here, section two. And when I say, let Israel say, you respond, his love endures forever. You guys right here, you're section three. And so when I say, let the house of Aaron say, you respond, let me hear you. His love oh, see, you got it. You got it. And then finally, you guys, section four, you are those who fear the Lord. You respond, his love endures forever. If you're watching from home, you just get to pick a section. <laughs> Whoever's your favorite section, or you could cheat and do all four. It's up to you. You're watching from home. All right. And the idea is to imagine what it would have been felt, what it would have felt like to be walking towards Jerusalem with a crowd of people reciting this call and response together. Are you ready? I'm looking at you guys. <laughs> Give thanks to the Lord. For he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say. His love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say. His love endures forever. Let all those who fear the Lord say. His love endures forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Very good. Very good. That's what it would have been like as they're all walking together a affirming what they know and believe about God. That's what they start with, the eternal, enduring love of their creator. But after you affirm that, what do you do next? Well, what they did next is that they thanked God. They thanked God for the place that they were today, and they thought back to those times where they were in hard spots, their hard challenges in their life, and then God was there for them. So these are the next verses. I'm not going to make you shout them, but I still want you to imagine them. They go on in verse 5. When in narrow straits I cried to the Lord, he brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. So, are you imagining what it would have been like as these people are thinking back in their lives during the times where they were in a, a bind? They, they had something in their life that was an issue, a problem, and they cried out to the Lord. That was their response. They said, I needed a time of rescue, and I cried out to the Lord. I, I want to take a closer look at that very first verse, because it's a beautiful, beautiful image. The first verse that said, when in narrow straits, I cried to the Lord, and he brought me into a spacious place. Don't you love the, the imagery there? going from narrow to spacious. You know, because a narrow place, a narrow place encourages you to think about those times when you're in a bind, when, when you're in a crunch, you're in a pinch, right? You're in a narrow spot, and you don't know how to get out of the mess that you find yourself in. So when you're in that narrow place, what do you do? Well, what they're affirming together as a congregation is, they said, well, we cry out to God. That's what we do. If we're in that narrow, tight spot in our lives, we cry out to God. And God then moves us to a spacious place. We're no longer cramped, stuck, unable, or unknowingly what to do to get out. No, God moves us 
to a place of possibility, a spacious place where we can see more of the options around us. And when you have that kind of confidence in God, that God is willing and able to move you from the narrow to the spacious, then you realize, well, we've got nothing to fear then. We've got nothing to fear because we have a God that is willing to do those for us. And so they go on to recite, then what can mere mortals do to me? Uh, Even if they're a prince, what can princes do to me? No, when we have this kind of God on our side, what do we have to fear? What could possibly stand in the way of God removing us from the problems, the challenges of life into places where we can thrive? Uh, Their response would be nothing. There's nothing that we need to fear. Now, we're not going to recite the whole psalm today because it is a longer one, although I encourage you, go home and read it. Read Psalm 118. You're going to love what you read. Uh, We're actually going to skip ahead a little bit. We're going to skip ahead to verse 19 uh, and think about what we've done so far. As a congregation, we have affirmed God's enduring love. We have then talked about how God's been with us in the places where we don't know how to get out of by our own means. And then now, what you need to imagine is that now the gates of Jerusalem are directly ahead of you. Right? That you can almost reach out and touch them now. The temple is in view. You can kind of see it through the gates of Jerusalem, and you're getting ready to go into the place where you worship God. Worship the God of enduring love and ever present rescue. So when all of that is in view, here's what they shouted next They would say, Open for me the gates of the righteous, and I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter, and I will give thanks, you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. Did you catch it? Our Palm Sunday saying that we're wondering what was the root of that saying. There it was right near the end of Psalm 118, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. All four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when they recount the story of Palm Sunday, they all talk about the crowd reciting this one phrase from Psalm 118 as Jesus is processing into Jerusalem. Why do you think they did that? Why do they, you think that whoever read those accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, they wanted to draw you back into this particular psalm? Well, I mean, think about the similarities. Think about the similarities between what's happening when Jesus is going and entering, right, processing into Jerusalem, and what they did in generations past when they processed together into Jerusalem and recited this psalm. In fact, here's two similarities that I really want to draw to your attention because I think it's fascinating. The first is that Jesus, in that New Testament story, he's entering into Jerusalem in a time of celebration, right? It's a time of celebration because the crowd is believing that Jesus, at the end of his ministry— After three years of preaching and teaching and healing, he is now entering into Jerusalem, and they believed that he was now going to to rise as their Savior and would save the people from their sins. Obviously, he did that in a way that was unexpected. He did that through the cross. But at this moment, as they're seeing Jesus head to that capital city, that's a time of celebration. Because they believe this, this is finally the moment that God has sent 
God's Messiah to save us, Hosanna. And so they thought back to their own history and said, we need to recite a hallelujah psalm because this is a time of celebration. The second similarity is that Jesus is, in fact, processing into Jerusalem. Jesus is walking that same road that would have been walked by all those generations before of people who recited this psalm and then walked in to Jerusalem. Yes, so Jesus, he's entering through those very same gates that this crowd, their ancestors, would have entered into. So they use the same words that have been said probably hundreds of times as others have walked through that gate. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That phrase must have been a cherished phrase for generations, from people who, who lifted up that phrase as an affirmation of the type of God they worship and what God had been willing to do for them and what is now going to do through Jesus. So they saw all of these similarities and said, now it's all come into fulfillment. And because of that, we want to stand upon this long heritage of our ancestors to say, Jesus is now fulfilling what they've been expecting for a long, long time. So they say that phrase, and they affirm all that they know about God. And then do you want to see how this psalm ends? Here are the last couple of verses, and I want you to look for one final reference to Palm Sunday, all right? Here's the last phrase. They go on to say, The Lord is our God, and he has made his light shine on us. With branches in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. Yes, you are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Don't you love that? You know, palms in hand, they say, let's process together. Let's head into the temple now. They're through the gates. They're heading into the temple. They're saying, this is now our place of worship where we worship a God who we know to be good, whose love endures forever. Yes, for them and for us, today is a day of celebration. No boredom allowed. Today is a day that we celebrate for the very same reasons that they celebrated so long ago. It's because when Jesus comes to town, we recognize what a difference that makes in our lives. What a difference that continues to make in our lives. Because Jesus didn't just process 2,000 years ago. You no, know, every time we share this story, which we do each and every year, we're recognizing that Jesus is processing once again in our hearts. And so we respond with the same sort of enthusiasm and celebration that was responded first in Psalm 118, and then next when Jesus actually processed in. So won't you leave this place today with that same sense of celebration and exaltation for a God whose love endures forever, for a God who is with you whenever you are in need of rescue. Yes, carry this with you into Holy Week this feeling, this sense of celebration because of what God has done on your behalf. I would really encourage you, find a reason to celebrate in God. Find a reason this week to celebrate. Whether you're recognizing that God has taken you from a narrow place to a spacious place, or whether you're just grateful to be here in church or be watching online, find a reason to celebrate because that is what today is all about. Amen. If you would like more information about Unity Presbyterian Church, please visit our website at www.unitypres.org or visit us on Facebook. This is the Unity Presbyterian Church Podcast. Have a great week.